Smile is mid. M I D mid. And that brings us to the end of the video. If you liked it, why not like and subscribe? It definitely helps me out. If you didn't, th I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Now, to be clear, a mediocre movie doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. I can think of a few movies off the top of my head that I consider to be mediocre, but I still had a good time with. For example, Sinister 2012. I think that had an incredible premise, but dropped the ball here and there. It's mediocre, but it's a fun movie. And oh, the, the video I just did, Jeepers Creepers. It's average, but still fun. Now, Smile is one of those movies where it has so many interesting ideas that it could pursue, but it just doesn't do them, opts for cliche nonsense, or just shoves the movie's thematics like right down your throat. Why should you ever let the audience piece together the themes or see how an element plays into everything when you can just insist and insist and yeah, there's the plot, there you go. There's a, there's a letterbox review on this movie that I think still rings so true to it. The review is gonna come in handy later. It's like the surprise tool in the Mickey Mouse show. Like his, his, his mouse ka tool. Toodles have the tools. All right, I, I want to read off the review to you, and I want you to take note of it because it's going to come in handy later, okay? By Haunted Hippie with a three-star review says, The real trauma was the trauma. We traumaed along the trauma. Can you see where this might be going? Also, you're watching a commentary video on a movie. So shocking, I know, but there, there will be spoilers about this film. So let's rant and rave about it. If there's anything that you find in this review that you feel like I should have mentioned or that I missed, please feel free to let me know in a comment below. In the last video, I loved finding all sorts of different perspectives and interpretations on things that I might have simply missed out on. But anyway, enough of my blabbering. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hop in today's video. This video is sponsored by Honeygain. Honeygain is an application that allows you to earn cash simply just by having the app running in the background. You're not exactly going to be a billionaire with the money, but it does offer enough to where it could cover subscriptions, like Apple Music or Spotify. All you need to do is download the app and you can start earning some money from it. My immediate questions were about the security and safety side. Honeygain is very transparent about internet connection usage. So, for example, your internet could be used for something like content delivery. It's safe. The traffic is encrypted and monitored, and it won't impact your internet usage experience. If you want more earnings, you can invite your friends and earn 20% off of their daily hustle. If you're feeling lucky, you can also try the Lucky Pot and win an average of $10 daily. Use promo code NIGHT when you sign up or hit the link in the description. You'll get a free $3 right off the bat. Thanks Honeygain for sponsoring this video. I remember learning about Smile from the huge viral marketing campaigns that it was running in 2022, and I mean, huge amounts of marketing. If you don't remember it, I'm honestly surprised. They hired actors to show up to baseball games and news broadcasts wearing these neon yellow shirts that had the word smile written across them. The actors would then just stare at the camera and smile very creepily. It got a lot of buzz and a lot of people talking. It worked out pretty well for them, I'd say, especially because the movie was made on a budget of 17 million, had an opening day of 23 million, and eventually grossed $217 million worldwide. That's that's literally like a 90% profit margin. I, I think it did well. I think I think the movie did well. I will say though, Smile is a movie that I feel like is someone's gateway into horror movies. Like, if you've never seen one before, you'll probably have a lot of good things to say about it. Not to say that if you've seen other horror movies, you won't. It's, it's just that there's a lot of things in this movie that fall under a very traditional, tropey, predictable movie. That being said, if you're going to make a somewhat predictable movie, don't make it nearly two hours long. Oh my god. God, I had fun with this movie, like I said, but there was so much that didn't need to be there. So many scenes that I'm actually going to push past in this review because there's maybe a second of need for it. This movie easily could have been an hour and 30 minutes. They decided to let it drag on for a lot longer than it needed to. Speaking of the movie, let's actually talk about it now. I've been ranting and raving and flailing my arms. The movie hasn't even started yet. And I'm already getting hyper. I'm already getting hyped. So 
Let's dive in. The movie kicks off with our main character witnessing her mother pass away in the bed. There are pills, alcohol bottles, cigarette cartons, and a bunch of other items strewn about on the floor and on the nightstand. In a bit of a predictable fashion, the music swells and cuts from the child main character to the adult main character, seemingly waking from an accidental nap in her office. Meet Rose Cotter, played by Sosie Bacon. She's a psychiatrist working in the hospital psychiatric ward. Maybe a bit redundant, but that it's worth mentioning. There's a scene in this movie where she's talking with a person who's going through some sort of manic break. Speaking so rapidly and quickly, there's just barely any time for the person to breathe. It honestly felt pretty convincing. The actor's performance in the scene really did impress me. You could just tell like they're just they're just manic. Rose talks with Carl for a bit and assures him that he will be okay. After putting him into observation for a few days, she heads over to Dr. Desai's office, Rose's supervisor. In the next scene, we see a woman getting removed from the back of an ambulance, thrashing and writhing about. I feel like the scene tries a bit too hard with the music that's being shown. It does that stereotypical swell of music up until something minor happens, and then all of a sudden the ambience and build up just drops. It's a pretty classic horror movie thing to do, so I can't fault it too much, but I don't know, like, I feel like maybe if the music was a little bit more interpretive, it would make the scene kind of go a little bit better because it already makes you wonder what is this lady doing why is she thrashing about what's going on i i didn't think the swell of like the whoa like i i, I don't know <laughs> i just didn't think it was necessary after a talk with desai about how a patient can't afford to stay with a unit due to a lack of insurance you can tell this weighs on rose it's a smidge expo dumped but at the core of rose's character you can tell that she cares about people. It's not about the money. She hates the board of execs that only care about the profits and not the people. She wants more than anything to help. And you can clearly see that. Before she leaves for the day though, her desk phone rings and she's tasked with meeting a woman named Laura Weaver. As they run through her file, you're able to pick up that she's clearly unwell. Police were called on her for a public disturbance and last week she'd seen her professor bludgeon himself until his death with a hammer. It's been a rough week for her. When stepping into the room, you can see a very on edge Laura in the corner of the room. After Rose gently asks Laura to sit with her, Laura walks over and joins her. I suppose there's a procedure when asking a manic patient questions, because Rose asks questions like, what day of the week is it, the month, and so on. Pretty standard stuff, but it makes sense why they're asking these questions. I I've heard that patients with dementia as an example. They'll ask things like who is the current president just to see if you're able to remember those things. This scene just kind of added an overwhelming sense of realism for me. Laura's actress, Caitlin Stacy, puts on a pretty solid performance in this scene. I can feel how distraught and confused she is. This entire scene is pretty gripping as she goes back and forth with Rose, desperately trying to convince her that she isn't crazy. She talks about seeing something that looks like a normal person, but she knows isn't one. This thing also bears a very creepy smile. S smile? The movie? And she always feels unnerved when seeing it, believing that something terrible is going to happen to her and that this entity told her that she was going to die today. Out of nowhere, Laura starts screaming and thrashing in the room. She pushes herself to the wall, screaming about how the entity is here. As Laura panics, Rose runs to the phone to call for help. But the room falls silent as Laura stands with a smile on her face. And using a piece of the vase that broke after kicking the table, Laura drags the vase from the side of her face all the way across. It's a super, super graphic scene. I didn't exactly pay attention to what this movie was rated before I watched it, so I was actually pretty shocked by how violent it was. It's a pretty gnarly scene. To be clear, I have no issues with violence, alright? Violence is fine, alright? I'm not a baby. The Evil Dead movies are like one of my favorites, right? You know, they're just like, yeah, blood, blood everywhere. Who needs continuity across our movies? Blood. Rose is questioned about what happened by the worst cops ever. This dude on the left is like, yeah, we get this is a psych ward, but tell us about her. She was a head case, right? Basically, head case meaning being like a, like a maniac, like a madman. Um, it's absolutely wild stuff to be saying to a doctor. The guy on the right is even like, 
Jesus, why do, why do I even work with this guy? And has to restate what he's saying more appropriately. There's even a part where Rose is running through what happened, talking about the way she was smiling while she died. And this guy is literally like, yeah, she sounds fucking crazy to me. Like, my guy, come on. I I'm so conflicted how I should feel about this scene because it's partly... It's partly dark humor levels of funny, but I also believe that the movie is intending to just show how shitty that the cop is. But like, I don't know if that's supposed to be in like a serious manner or in like a dark humor sort of manner. Maybe it's both. I guess both can work. It then cuts to Rose's car driving down the road and it, it employs this awful shot that I just can't stand. This movie does it on multiple occasions and I just can't stand why they did it. Rose's car is driving off, and I suppose out of artistic liberty, you can see the camera start to adjust itself to a point to where it goes upside down. Why does it do this? Does this have symbolism that I'm missing? Am I the one on the other side of the you just don't get it coin where I genuinely don't get it? I just didn't like it. I just think it's a terrible shot. Why would, what, what do we gain by doing this? Get ready for more of me complaining about this though, because it's not the only one. There's more, there's multiple. Sorry, I, I got a little unhinged there. Rose gets home and is greeted by her cute cat, Mustache. Clearly worked up from a stressful day, she unwinds with a shower and a glass of wine. As Rose looks across the room, it's clear something catches her eye. The camera pans as this rumbly ambience builds. You then see Laura shrouded in darkness, smiling at Rose. As this rumble builds, Rose's fiance says her name and the light flicks on. Meet Trevor, played by Jesse Usher, or sorry, A-Train, holy shit it's A-Train. In all seriousness though, uh, I really like the way the scene is presented. There's no major jump scare with like a demon in your face or something. It's just interesting audio choices and well-positioned shots. It turns out nice. As I was going through the movie to make this review, I got creeped out by it again. It, it works nicely. After a brief conversation with Trevor, she informs him that she's a bit stressed due to a patient passing away under her watch. They proceed with their dinner plans and Rose is clearly out of it. She's disconnected from the conversation and this is accompanied by that sort of muffled underwater sounding audio coming from Holly, Rose's sister. She's just not there at all. Honestly, I don't blame her. Holly's talking about how she has no time at all for her Pilates and that her kid is eating up her time. Like, oh my God, who would want to listen to this? Rose gets berated by Holly after forgetting that Saturday is her nephew's birthday. She says that she can't go due to work and a bit of an argument unfolds. Just in this scene alone, it does feel like their relationship is a bit strained. It also could have been from Rose being traumatized about her experience at work. The next day at work though, Rose isn't there mentally. She's very obviously still shaken up. She almost has to snap herself back to the present to get into work mode. She desperately needs time to cope, but from everything we've seen, it does seem like she's a person that would just rather work through it all. Rose then inquires about getting Laura's police report forwarded to her, and then the policeman from yesterday talks with Laura. This is Joel. While the scene doesn't explicitly state it, and we learn it later, it's pretty clear that Joel is an ex-partner of Rose. In my opinion, this entire scene plays out like a comedy. Joel, after being on a call nearby, decided to just stop by to check on Rose to see how she was doing. Come on, bro. You know she's engaged. Do better, Joel. Come on, do better. Back in Rose's office, though, she starts going through the police report and gets a call from Holly. She apologizes for being out of line. However, as Rose looks out the window, she sees Laura standing a few stories down, looking at her, smiling. It then cuts to Rose walking down the hall, and you see Carl smiling at her as well. Carl begins shouting about how Rose is going to die and starts getting a bit too close for comfort. You're going to die! Okay. Listen. Listen to me. Listen to me right now. I know I shouldn't be laughing. I shouldn't find amusement in this scene, okay? I get it. I get it. It's supposed to be scary. <laughs> but I was, I was just dying. The little hit of sound that happens when he says, you're gonna die, was just ridiculous. 
The line delivery of you're going to die reminded me of that video of I show speed going, you, you're gonna die. You're about to die. Clint, please play that clip. You, you're gonna die. You're about to die. You're gonna die. All I saw was speed in this scene. I couldn't see anything else. Also, because this is a hallucination, you can tell that when reality sets back in, Carl is just asleep in the bed. So these nurses burst in, having heard about this aggressive patient, and just manhandle this poor bastard to the floor. Again, I know it's supposed to be scary, but oh my god, the chaos in this scene just had me rolling. He's screaming like, no, 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 because he, he genuinely was just sleeping. This man is innocent, and these nurses are just taking him down. Again, probably shouldn't laugh. I probably shouldn't laugh. I gotta be a better man, but <laughs> I couldn't help myself. It's it's just so over the top. After this incident, she talks with her supervisor and he puts her on a paid week off. She apparently had been working 80 hour weeks for that month. So Rose just needed to get out of the workplace. Honestly, smart move on the supervisor's part. You can tell that he cares about her. Rose then goes to her car and tries to decompress and then cuts to the stupid upside down shot again why it doesn't look good already why do we on the way home though she picks up a toy for her nephew's birthday party and starts wrapping it at the dining room table honestly this is my least favorite part about horror movies this is coming from a person who loves a slow burn horror flick by the way but i just despise when horror movies just think they can get away with sluggishly keeping a scene going in the name of Ooh, it's building suspense. Isn't this so suspenseful? No, it's not. And you're wasting time. It takes about a minute in the time of this movie to convey what could have been a few seconds. You see her getting the wrapping paper for the gift, putting the wine in the fridge, sitting at the table, wrapping the present, texting her fiance, getting up, going to the kitchen, getting more wine. Like, dude, why not just show her at the table with the wrapping paper? Maybe her putting a bow on it. Isn't it often implied with a gift that you wrap it with wrapping paper? Why show her getting it? From the moment it cuts to her house up to her going to the kitchen, it takes about a minute. The reason I mentioned the kitchen specifically as a cutoff point is because a scare happens when her like emergency alarms go off. It's just like, why is this taking so long? Did it need to be a minute? This very well could have been reduced. As I said earlier at the beginning, there's a lot of fat in this movie that just could have been trimmed. It should have been a quick in and out sort of horror flick. This didn't need to be two hours. God, All right, I'm sorry, that was, that was a tangent. That was a tangent, I had to let it out. Did I have a stressful work week? Moving on though, she drops her wine glass again. Maybe use plastic cups from now on, Rose. Her security alarms are blaring as she surveys the house. There seems to be no signs of an intruder, so she turns off the alarm and sees the back door open, right where she was sitting. I went back to the previous scene to see if anyone was actually behind her, and I couldn't find anything, unfortunately. I think that would have been so cool if you could see a figure, like, looming behind her. I think it would have played perfectly into the whole like unreliable narrator bit that this movie embraces. Rose gets phoned by her security company asking for her name and password. Rose explains the situation and the woman asks if she's alone. Rose says no, but the call suddenly takes a turn as the operator asks, are you sure? Are you sure you haven't let something inside? The woman then asks Rose to turn around. All around, super freaky scene. It doesn't help that when Rose turns back around, she comes back to reality and learns that she never answered the phone at all. It was just a hallucination. Pretty cool scene. Quick, play a jump scare sound. After cops confirm that no one is inside, Trevor talks with Rose. Their relationship is shown pretty realistically here as Trevor cares about his partner and wants to make sure she's in the right headspace. It's hard to deny that these hallucinations are making Trevor see her a little differently though. She seems way more all over the place, unhinged, sporadic, and maybe even a little dangerous considering this next scene. Rose wakes up from a nightmare involving her mother and listens to the audio from Laura's conversation on the day of her death. 
As Rose listens, she enhances the audio and learns that her name is spoken on that day. This, of course, could have been another hallucination, though. Dead woman jump scare. Rose grabs a knife in fear and holds it at Trevor as he comes barreling into the room. There's a lot of chaos in this scene, and I love it. It shows how much Rose is slipping and mentally declining. Seemingly aware that she's slipping, she talks with her therapist. She basically explains everything that's been going on, and the therapist concludes that witnessing such a traumatic event reignited some previous trauma she had when she was a kid, which was seeing her mother die. The next scene shows Rose in her bathroom using makeup to cover up her eye bags and try to force a smile in the mirror. This scene was really creepy to me. It's reminiscent of the previous smiling scenes with the hallucinations, but you can just tell by the smile she's forcing that she's just not well at all. Something is clearly going on. Rose shows up to the nephew's party though, with a gift in hand and immediately gets harassed by a woman asking for advice since she's a therapist. Shout out to the artists in my audience because I know that y'all have had to deal with this exact situation before. Oh, you draw? Well, can you draw me? Oh, you're in computer science? Well, I noticed my internet is kind of weird right now. Oh, you're a mechanic? Can you take a look at my car? Like, dude, no, they will not. They will not. As Rose's nephew opens presents, the child eventually gets to her present. As he unwraps it, it shows a now deceased cat. It makes the scene from earlier where Rose was looking for Mustache much more sinister. The reason she couldn't find him was because she had already wrapped him up in the gift box. I appreciate when movies incorporate little pieces of information like that into newer scenes. It brings life to what might have potentially been seen as unnecessary. And I know that's a bit rich as I had complained about that very scene, <laughs> but my points are still valid. It could have been reduced. This movie's long. Shut up. This scene is pretty intense, but I kind of got distracted by the initial reveal of the cat because it looks a bit fake to me. I can't tell if it's my eyes just playing tricks on me, but the way the cat moves around in the child's hand just doesn't seem real. And the next shot where Rose gets to hold it, it looks real. There's just something about the reveal that kind of looks off. As Rose attempts to explain herself, she sees a party attendee smiling at her. In a panicked state, after this attendee suddenly appears in front of her, she falls through a glass table. <clears throat> Again? I, I know I, I know I shouldn't laugh. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. But I did. I don't know why. I thought it was funny. I need to be better than this, but... But I giggled. Thought it was, thought it was a bit over the top. I thought it was a bit funny. Sorry. I will add that I liked the soundtrack in this scene, except for the jump scare sound. The sputtery electronics as the smiling person is revealed just kept me so on edge. It was really good. That jump scare sound, though, sounded like someone got eliminated on X Factor. <laughs> Rose is now looking rough from all the hallucinations and things that she has endured. She tries to explain to Trevor what's going on, but it seems very reminiscent of what happened with Laura. No one really believing that what she's seeing is real and her getting very aggressive about it. There's a pretty dark scene of Rose looking at herself in the mirror that I found pretty disturbing as well. Seeing her lose so much sense of self sent shivers down my spine. It's, it's just really grim. She just looks so unwell. Back to her bedroom, she starts to research Laura's professor, and suddenly she hears her name being called from the dark hallway. Yep, immediate, immediate no, absolutely not. Let me put 50 on no, please. That doesn't seem fun. That sounds terrifying. She then hears this voice tell her to come here. As she turns the lights off and attempts to sleep, the camera pans to a person in the doorway smiling. You learn from the dialogue that it's a hallucination of her mother. Rose name jump scare with car horn. God, it's just so cheap. It's so bad. The next morning, she goes to the house of the former professor and finds his wife. There's an interesting homage to the ring in this movie that I'll just keep hidden for now. If you've watched the ring, you can see how when the wife is describing what happened to the husband, it pays tribute to the ring. It was pretty cool and actually startled me a bit the first time I watched it. Rose learns that the professor had also witnessed a woman uh, cease her existence in front of him. Thanks, YouTube. Uh, I, I gotta love playing Mad Libs to describe this stuff. That's, that's super fun. Um, but Rose begins to ask more questions and suddenly the woman becomes hostile, calling Rose a nutcase and that she needs to leave 
her house. Rose finds herself going back to Joel, the police officer, so he can get police records for her. Rose finds several cases where these incidents have taken place. With these cases, it happens to be that one person goes through with their act, it goes on to someone else, and then they do the same thing. It's almost like a curse. As she looks through this footage, she notices that one person, moments before their death, was smiling. If you haven't caught onto the metaphorical vehicle in this horror movie, it's trauma. Remember that letterbox review? The mouse Katul, we're using it now, okay? <laughs> the idea is that trauma and more specifically unresolved trauma can reveal itself in pretty horrific ways. While there are like these external paranormal reasons as to why this stuff is happening, the main point is that trauma can leave pretty deep scars on a person even when they think they're okay. And speaking of all of that, uh, before we go any further, I just wanted to let you know to keep going. If things may seem dark for you right now, I encourage you to keep waking up, keep showing up, and just keep being there. The last thing you should do is just give up. You're capable of so much, so please. Take care of yourself. Moving back into the movie, Rose stops by her house with printed documents of evidence, and she sees her therapist and Trevor on the couch. They get into a scuffle before she storms off to Holly's. As Rose tries to explain everything to her, Holly isn't having any of it. She simply says she is having a breakdown and that she sounds like her mom. You can notice an immediate tone shift in the way that they talk to each other here. This is no longer Holly and Rose yelling at each other. This is sister and sister. It's a pretty impactful scene. You hear Holly lament about how she had to get out of the house because she couldn't handle mom and that it was unfair for Rose. This, this scene just resonates with me a lot because I have siblings myself and I care deeply about them. I, I wouldn't want anything to happen to them. So hearing Holly feel so horrible for leaving Rose behind so that she could get out was was difficult. My life isn't like traumatic in the way that theirs was, but that connection with your siblings, it's it's very impactful and it's a very powerful and and real feeling. And I think the way it's captured in this movie was uh was really nice. It went rather well. The tenderness kind of fades as they sort of start to take jabs at each other. This causes Holly and Rose to go their separate ways. As Rose tries to decompress, Holly steps out and gets her attention. Wait a minute, that's not Holly. Jump scare time. Rose then goes to a diner and goes to town on a burger. Like, damn Rose, that sh is not going anywhere. That is all yours. After getting a call from Joel informing her of more cases, she figures out that there was an exception to these cases. Robert Talley, a person who went out and murdered someone, but the key witness to that murder continued the usual cycle. They both go to the police station and meet with Robert. Rose then learns that the only way to escape this curse is to take the life of a person in front of a witness, but it needs to be in such a manner that it carries that curse, or the trauma, to them. Rose accidentally lets it slip that she had the curse, and Robert completely freaks out screaming, get away from me, and pulling so hard from the chair he's sitting in that it looks like he's about to break the attached handcuffs. Now, I can proudly say that this scene wasn't amusing to me. Not one bit. I know, I know, I, I laughed at the other ones, but, but not this one. This wasn't funny, and I remained serious. I'm lying. I, I laughed. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Also, Quick tangent, I promise, but but I think I've just found a whole way to beat this this pattern, this cycle, right? So the person witnessing it probably wouldn't know what's happening, but let's say they did for this. Like, like they knew that if they watched it, they'd have to do the deed as well, right? But like, like what if the person got right up to like about to do it, like a second before, but then you just, you know, like, like I, I could do that. I, I didn't see anything. Why? Cause, cause I'm quick. Like, like, like I'm the flash dude. Like, you see how easy that is? Like, boom, just look away, dumbass. Rose eventually goes home, dismissing what Robert had said as insane and crazy. As she obsesses over the case, her therapist shows up and has a session with her. In the middle of explaining herself, 
her phone rings and dun dun da the therapist is on the other line demon therapist is in front of her no 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 dramatic music it's so dramatic and oh my goodness i couldn't have foreseen another hallucination i couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe my eyes. As the therapist smiles, a demonic voice says that it's almost time. I like the execution of this scene for the most part, but the demonic voice almost time, Rose. weirdly enough didn't make it scary for me. The last hallucination call with the security operator where like her voice drops slightly, but isn't enough to where it's seen as like this demonic entity was, was way better. Also, if the idea is that the entity is inhabiting the bodies of people that she recognizes, I don't understand why, like why the voice would change so much. I just didn't like it too much. It, it was a pretty effective scene. I just thought that one part was a little was a little weak sauce. I'm sorry. There's also another pretty fun homage to Alien in this scene as Rose gets followed by the therapist. Like the last one, I won't show it, but it's cool. If you know, you know. Rose then drives to the hospital and has a very vivid hallucination of killing Carl in front of her supervisor. I remember the first time watching this scene, I thought this is how it was going to end. I was like, wow, okay, this is, this is brutal, but... All right, I'll take it. It's pretty crazy. It's a pretty crazy way to end the movie. I only realized it was a hallucination when the supervisor started peeling his face off. Snapping back to reality, Rose comes to in her car and is approached by her supervisor. After noticing the knife in her vehicle, he attempts to get her to come inside and just unwind and that she feels that she's unsafe. A sudden Carl jump scare happens and then she peels off. At this point, Rose has just completely gone off the rails. It's it's so bad that she's at this point premeditating a, a, a murder, a potential murder. It's it's not looking good for her, but she does have an idea. She thinks that she needs to be alone. If this entity needs someone else to witness what goes down, she'll simply just isolate herself. Joel calls in a panic, asking what is happening, as she explains what I said to y'all. Also, real quick, where's Trevor? We haven't heard from this man in, in a minute. Is he still alive? What's going on with him? Man, I sure hope we don't get another stupid upside down shot of a landscape. Oh, mother Rose arrives at this abandoned home, and you learn that it's her old house, the one where she watched her mother die. She walks through the house and eventually goes into her mother's room. It cuts to child Rose as she sees her mother on the bed, clearly ill. You can put together from this scene that this might have been her final moments. She wants Rose to call for help, but she shakes her head no and leaves with tears filling her eyes. So, real quick, this place is supposed to be abandoned, but in my opinion, the condition doesn't seem too bad. Of course, it's not amazing. Not exactly a home you'd you'd pick first, but you know it it's a fixer upper. You know, it's got some good bones. Right? No? Am I the only one? Feel free to drop a comment. Do you think it's a fixer upper? Rose sits down in a chair and just waits. She hears the bedroom door open and finds her mother sitting on the bed. They have a very intense conversation, going back and forth about the trauma that each of them had experienced or things that they had dealt with. It's a very heavy scene. The horror elements of this scene still are present. It's not like they disappear, but it's just interesting watching as Rose is going face to face with her mother or her trauma. Rose says none of this is real, but then the mother responds with, but Rose, your mind makes it real as she smiles. As Rose attempts to close the door, the mother prevents it as her towering figure storms down the hall. If you've seen It Follows, it totally reminds me of a very particular scene from that movie. I don't know if it's an homage per se, but due to the other ones, I feel like it's a safe bet to say it is, but I don't know. The lack of light on the face works really well too, makes it so much more scary. This eventually leads to Rose being pinned to the floor by the monster. The creature remarks to Rose that she can't escape her own mind, but Rose says that it's her mind and that she can't escape it either. She then smashes a lantern onto the monster, and it immediately gets engulfed in flames. Rose leaves as the house burns down. It's a pretty wild scene to watch. The way the creature just throws itself about was really eerie. Like, yay, we, we did it! 
We defeated the, the big bad evil evil man, the monster. We did it. Yay, movie over, right? Uh, don't don't hold your breath. So Rose goes back to Joel's apartment and apologizes for what happened and, and asks if he can watch her sleep for safety. As Joel agrees to this, it's a very tender moment. You can tell they're like, oh, there's like a lot of emotional vulnerability going on. It's like, oh my gosh, we're going to get a happy ending, blah, blah, blah. Joel begins to smile as darkness washes over the room. Wait, the trauma never left and it remained? You're telling me that I can't just burn trauma alive to combat it and it takes therapy, time, and patience? This scene would have been so much more effective if Joel didn't laugh. <laughs> If he just sat there and looked at Rose as she realized what was going on, it, it would have changed the atmosphere of this scene so much. His little laugh didn't do it for me at all. She attempts to leave as Joel chases after her and finds herself outside the house once again. This time, Joel is outside, real Joel, outside his vehicle and watches as Rose runs back into the house. Joel attempts to kick the door down as the entity draws closer to Rose and she cries and screams. The entity then peels back its face in a really freaky manner. You've probably heard or seen the clip. It's pretty gnarly shit. The entity then steps into the mouth of Rose and Joel kicks the door down. Once inside, Joel sees Rose with a smile a box of matches, and her clothes that have been doused in some flammable liquid. You watch as Joel's eyes illuminate from the flames, seemingly burning the image of Rose's self-immolation into his head forever. And with that, the movie ends. Overall, this movie is a fun watch. I had a great time. I had some good scares, and I actually enjoyed the, the metaphorical vehicle it used in the movie. Most horror stems from a certain place, whether it's grief, like in the Babadook, or in this case, trauma. The angle was fun, and while yes, it did feel like you got like beat over the head with, hey guys, it's trauma, did you know the point of the movie's trauma, guys, I think it's about trauma, 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 like, like I need a trauma counter for this movie, because it, it, it was insane how many times trauma was mentioned. Which is why, again, we go back to the Letterbox review, the trauma that we trauma all over the trauma. We trauma all over the place. Like, it's just so much. Like, okay, I think it's about trauma. Jesus Christ. Regardless of my quips, jokes, and some dislikings of the movie, I still had a fun time with it. I give this a three out of five. What did you think about this movie? Did you agree or disagree with some of my points? Let me know in the comments below. Before we hop into the end segment, I would like to have the patron scroll. Obviously, you do not, by any means, need to support this channel with patron subscriptions, but it honestly means so much. Sincerely. Thank you for supporting my weird little videos on the internet. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, why not like and subscribe? It definitely helps me out. If you didn't, though, why not dislike? Let me know what I can improve on for next time. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I'll see you on the next one.